morning, good morning. Hello, how are you? Well, it's a lovely day today. I'm on my way to do some NHS emergency work, by which I mean some emergency work that shouldn't be done on the National Health Service, but they can't find anyone to do it before they've had to throw themselves on the goodwill of the private sector to do get this particular person out of trouble. So, I won't say all of that, my lips are sealed. Things to say, it's really not in the world that was organised properly, but not me. It would be, it shouldn't be performed by the state. The state, are, you know, they're getting it, they're having their jam and cake and eating it, because they are taking all the tax money and then they got, you know, and I'm providing the service. So. I left this morning, my wife said to me, I was going to be paying for this, yes and I am, so I'm going to do it free of charge. So, so that's the sort of thing that I'm going to do with my bill anyway. So, oh my god, they're still bleating on about the Queen. My receptionist, without reference to me, which under normal circumstances wouldn't be a problem, because I do encourage them under my teleocratic management system to be uh, self sufficient, has decided to cancel next Monday. By, by cancel, I mean a few people cancelled, and then she decided, because it's suddenly been declared a bank holiday to um, move the rest of the patients out of the Monday into other, you know. And nobody's going to complain because it's the Queen's funeral and, you know, everybody and their grandmother's going to be there or want to watch it on the telly and everything. And so, you know, but it <clears throat> doesn't mean that nobody's going to be working. I mean, lots of people will be working. Everybody who works in a hotel in the West End is going to be working. All the uh, tube drivers are going to be working. Um, there's no reason why dentistry should stop functioning, you know, but it's the last... <laughs> it's the last... How can I... Not malevolent, but it's the last uh, unhelpful act of an unhelpful monarch that would run an unhelpful system. And I shall go on to uh, clarify what I mean by that, okay? Because my... I'm First of all, I mean, you may have guessed by now I'm not a monarchist, okay? I'm not a monarchist. And that's because that's the same reason I don't support the Freemasons and I don't believe in societies within societies. I don't think society thrives if there are secret societies that operate within it. And having come at, you know, and there are secret societies everywhere, everywhere. And I don't mean like, uh, you know, Satan worshipping room drawing societies, although I suppose there are a few of those around Salisbury. I mean, just cabals of people cliques of people, um, internal uh, uh, grand chambers. I'll give you a quick example. When I went along to the uh, National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence meetings that were supposed to be open to the public and started uh, reporting on them, I was told I couldn't report on them in, uh, in real time. Uh, because I wasn't allowed to use my mobile phone to send texts or, or WhatsApps or anything. I couldn't use a, um, a laptop because, uh, although the se committee secretary was using a laptop because they said it would be distracting. And uh, so I had to tweet out reports after the, after the meetings, you know, lunchtime and after uh, five o'clock. And then uh, on the second day, I was warned that uh, they didn't like being reported on in real time. Uh, although I don't know what the hell they, you know, this is where uh, transparency, uh, <laughs> the rubber meets the road. You say, yeah, we don't mind having the public in, and then you don't like the fact that the public put their own spin on, uh, come up with a, na a narrative which isn't your narrative, and report that in real time. You know, that was a bit of a culture shock for them, and Alan Marion Davis tore me off a right strip at the meeting, with his back to me, I might add, just talking to the air, you know, just saying, yeah, it's come to my attention, blah, blah, blah. So, 
They then uh, started meeting in private, by which I mean they were all staying in the same hotel, and so all the major business of the day was done before they even turned up to the nice meeting, uh, which became extremely boring and anodyne. And uh, so there was nothing for me to report because the meeting, they were holding a meeting within a meeting. That's the sort of thing I mean. And it goes on everywhere. You know, there's a cabal within the Department of Health. There's a cabal between the dentistry department, I should imagine, at the Department of Health. There's no point uh, ringing them up and saying, do you fancy going out for a dinner for a chat about policy? The answer will always be no, because you're, uh, we're self and you're non-self. And this no, nowhere was this demonstrated more uh, blatantly than in the award or withholding of the OBE. And uh, when I qualified, uh, a chief dental officer could expect and and more than that the uh, chairman of the general dental services committee which was the general practice subcommittee of the british dental association could expect an obe and they were routinely given it was they were just on the list of you know uh, to get one at some point and uh It was like, a, it was a favour for a service, except that it, it wasn't any old service. It had to be a service in pursuit of government objectives because the government nominates people for OBEs and also vetoes uh, people uh, who've been nominated. And uh, the OBEs were awarded for, um, what the hell was that? Uh, for for uh, towing the government line, basically, not not upsetting the apple cart, and uh, this became most obvious uh, when I was on the GDSC, and the chairman was a guy called Keith Ostelo, very nice, very likable bloke, um, but um, the government wanted to bring in a new dental contract, and Ostelo um, supervised a ballot of the profession. And uh, the ballot came in that they didn't want the contract. It, they voted against it. Now, uh, Oslo's fate was sealed at the point that he agreed to hold a referendum. <laughs> because, <coughs> you know, like Cameron's fate was sealed the minute he was manoeuvred into by Nigel Farage into holding the Brexit referendum. Because the, the, um, you know, <laughs> the higher levels of a democracy, they don't want them democracy. They, they don't want the democracy at that point. They want to maintain the status quo. They want to maintain their grip on power. Last thing they want is a load of spotty oics uh, voting on what they want that they want. So, and as it turned out, the uh, Oslo's last chance of getting an OBE was scuppered when the ballot came in nay. <laughs> so, no, no OBE for him, and it was, you know, it was blatantly obvious at the time. It was like, you know, everyone was like, oh, have you ever heard this? You know, he's, he's not, he's left the job, and he's not going to get an OBE. And the profession got the contract in any, in any case. Sorry about this line. I don't know where that's coming from. It's a sun, the sun. Yeah, it's a sun, isn't it? Let me try something. Hang on. Is that any better? No. Useless. The sun coming in. Anyway, look, I'm not going to crash the car. I'm trying to, because uh, the sun, yeah, we're moving around the corner anyway. So, um, so you know, you got the OBE. No wonder the private eye called it the Order of the Brown Nose, because the uh, it, it was a pernicious, a pernicious thing, and it certainly was within dentistry. And I'm sure that's just mirrored in other professions. What happened was that the, uh, you know, I've, I've gone on about this three-way boxing match which where you've got a profession in one corner, the BDA in the other corner and the public in the third corner. And the, um, uh, the what happens is the BDA conspires with uh, the government to uh, perpetuate both the positions of the BDA and the income and position, you know, sole negotiator of the BDA. And the public uh, gets... Uh, knocked out the the public thinks it's it's in, in you know it's a stakeholder and it's not and the obe is the reward uh you know i mean there's a load of other rewards as well you know funding and stuff like that and 
and uh, people who work within the BDA, like John, uh, what's his name, go on to become big knobs in the Care Quality Commission and stuff like that. But, um, you know, the revolving door, which again, you know, is, 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 is corruption in my opinion, but, you know, is so widely practiced that nobody can be bothered to do anything about it anymore. But the OBE, this all stems, it all stems and it all flows from the, the font. And the font of privilege, entrenched privilege, and the font of uh, self, non-self, was, is the crown. And to give you a rough idea how uh, someone will get an OBE, someone who's done a major service to the government will, um, if they hadn't even thought about it, will be uh, invited to consider applying for an OBE. And, um, but in order to apply for an OBE, you need a load of people saying what a wonderful person you are and how much work you've done for charity and how you've, what you've done has contributed towards your chosen profession, etc, etc. And um, you don't spontaneously get a load of people all of a sudden one year decide to write. I mean, you might do if you're like uh, some sort of saint who's worked in a community centre, who's saved the community centre cat or something. You might get a petition set out with a thousand people will write saying this person deserves an honour. But in practice, it's very much more mundane than that. What you're doing, you're told to step up your charity work if you haven't already, you know, you have to be doing some charity work and as much of that. Uh, the better, the more the better. And then you then contact all your friends and say, look, you know, I must, I'm not supposed to tell you this because it's all, this is a secrecy. It's right all. I'm not supposed to tell you this, but you know, I may be, I may be, I'm not saying I am, I may be in line for an OBE. And uh, it would help me <clears throat> uh, if you were minded to write me a letter saying what a brilliant bloke I am. And now I believe I should have an OBE. And don't worry about wasted effort because I've been assured, not promised mind you, but assured that it's pretty much a foregone thing. So in fact, you'll be known as the person who nominated someone for an OBE and they got it. And um, you know, just in case you are wondering how brilliant I am, here's my CV and a couple of draft letters that you could perhaps, you know, borrow a few paragraphs from. Um, and these are the people that you need to write to. <laughs> this is the closing date by which you need to send it in. <coughs> now, what do you think, old friend? Um, and of course, uh, that's that's exactly what happened to me when Amalak Singh got his OBE. He wrote to me and said, you know, said exactly that. And and Julie, Eddie Julie turned up, although I wasn't invited to the palace to see him get it. But, uh, <clears throat> so don't, uh, you know, let's just drop any pretense that uh, the honour system is a, um, a, rec is a, is a merit-based system. And let's just drop any pretense that it has a beneficial effect on the people it touches, because it, it isn't, it doesn't, you know, it, all it doesn't, it, what it does is it paralyses systems uh, because they are all the time looking, think, well, what would the what would the government want me to do? What would the Department of Health want me to say? What what am I allowed to object to? What am I mustn't touch, mustn't criticise? And um, uh, further than that, what happens is it, you know, you get a sort of a paralysis, what they call a chilling effect, where you know it's it, the, the, for a long time there was like, look, look, look what happened to Keith Osterley. You don't want that to happen to you, do you? You don't want to get in, spend all your life struggling to get into the top job and then <clears throat> put a word wrong and then find that your OBE uh, never materialises, that you don't ever get the phone call. Um, and so what's happened is it's meant that the government, that, that and the, the sort of the acquiescence of the BDA, the sort of uh, subservience um, in the pursuit of gongs, has um, meant that the uh, government has had a very firm control on policy, dental policy, and uh, uh, being a collectivist government, in other words, believing that some bloke or some woman in some office somewhere who's 
know, shall remain nameless, knows better than the market, can allocate resources better than the market, you know, can set prices better than the market, um, and it can invest capital better than the market, than, than everybody who works in it and knows on a day-to-day -day basis what needs to be done. Instead of the uh, service being provided as a uh, collect by the collective will of the people who use it, the stakeholders, it's set by a small committee or a, you know informal group of people, society within society, and that and then as a result, um, because of this incorrect allocation of resources, um, usually giving away ten pound notes for a fiver, um, the whole thing collapses, and so they don't get they got power, they got the power over nothing. The whole thing's turned to sand. And as we know, the tighter you grip, the more it will slip through your fingers. And the bit I'm about to do now has certainly slipped through someone's fingers. Someone's dropped a massive bollock on this. But, uh, leave it to Angry to fix it up. Assuming they turn up. This is, you know, this is one government branch trying to get help from another government branch and then trying to turn to the private sector, which are the very least means that they're going to have, they'll be paying the cost, the private cost of doing something that should be available in the public sector. So that's a waste of taxpayers' money for a start. And then I've offered to take on the job, and I'll do it free of charge, and I don't even know if they'll turn up. So if they don't turn up, then obviously we won't offer to do it again. It's very, uh, it's all very... Mind you, you've just got to deal with your problems one day at a time, haven't you? One day at a time, just try and be happy. All right, lovely. Nice to talk to you. Bye.